Hello, I'm Marvin Kalb, and in just a moment, an hour of live, unedited, unrehearsed conversation with Governor Michael Dukakis of Massachusetts, a Democratic candidate for President of the United States. Stay with us for Candidates 88, coming right up. This series is made possible by a grant from the New York Stock Exchange Foundation as a public educational service. From the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Candidate 88 with Marvin Town. This week, a conversation with Michael Dukakis. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. I'm Marvin Kalb, director of the Joan Shorenstein Barone Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. Among the six Democrats running for the presidency, there is one minister, one congressman, two senators, a former governor, and a governor who is still in charge of the state. That governor is Michael Dukakis, and the state is Massachusetts. We are told that Dukakis spends three days a week governing here in the state, and four days a week out on the road campaigning. Now, can a candidate do both successfully? That's one question we will ask the governor, but before we do, a little bit about him. Michael Stanley Dukakis is 54 years of age. Occupation, lawyer, governor, and presidential candidate. Hometown, Brookline, Massachusetts. Family, married, three children. Education, a BA, Phi Beta Kappa from Swarthmore College, a law degree from the Harvard Law School. Military service, U.S. Army, Korea, 1955 to 57. Career, a four-term state representative, moderator of the PBS television series, The Advocates, a lecturer at the John F. Kennedy School of Government, and three-term governor of Massachusetts. Let us now welcome Governor Michael Dukakis. You have already heard the first question. Uh, can you successfully and effectively both campaign and run a state? Marvin, if you're in your third term, if you have a very good team of people working for you and with you, if your legislature is five to one Democratic and as supportive as any legislature in the country, and if you spend a lot of your flight time during the half of the week that you are campaigning working on your governor's responsibilities, then you can do it. I guess I ask the question because if you look back in recent American history, the last three of the last four American presidents have not been in office while they were running full time for the presidency. They won. Uh, so I guess there's an obvious lesson that could be drawn there. Can you run the risk of doing both? You may fail. Well, if you fail, you fail. You still have your job as governor, and it's a good job. <laughs> But uh, I think there's something troubling about the notion that you have to be out of office in order to run for the presidency. Why troubling? Because it almost puts a premium on not being there, on not making decisions, on not having to make the tough choices, and not confronting the kinds of challenges that you have to confront as president. Nobody suggested that John Kennedy leave the Senate, for example, in 1959 and 1960. In fact, uh, we'd have been shocked if anybody had. So it seems to me that if you have a situation which uh, I'm fortunate enough to have in a state that has had a great deal of success and is doing well, then this is a very good base from which to run. And so far, I seem to be combining the two responsibilities pretty well. Uh, Governor, the centerpiece of uh, your campaign seems to be that you would like to transplant what you have called the Massachusetts miracle from this state to the other 49. Uh, what makes well, I don't you want think to transplant it. I want to leave it here. But you want to leave it here and then... I want to grow more of those flowers elsewhere. Okay, fair enough. Uh, what makes you think you can do that? Well, obviously, uh, 
every state, every region of the country uh, has a different mix of things which uh, in some cases make for an energy dominated economy, a mining dominated economy, a farm dominated economy, industrial dominated economy. But I think what has happened here, Marvin, is uh, at least an example of the kind of thing we can do all over the country. I inherited a state that was an economic and financial basket case, a massive deficit uh, state with the second highest unemployment rate in the country. And I think what we've demonstrated is that you can take public resources, combine those public resources with private initiative, and literally transform an economy. That's the kind of aggressive economic leadership we have to have in this country, beginning with somebody who knows how you balance budgets and make tough choices on spending, but also can put together a strategy for growth in this country which uh, will be successful, will create jobs and economic opportunity for all of our citizens. So when you found that basket case and you began to take steps to correct it, you were voted out of office the next time Well, it's always a risk you run. Uh, I think with the benefit of hindsight and a certain amount of experience, I might have done things a little differently. And when I came back in in 1983 and inherited another deficit, and a state where uh, one-third of its communities had double-digit unemployment, I think I did things better and more effectively, in part because of the experience I had in my first term. Okay, now you have claimed credit for the Massachusetts miracle. You've done it again in part, this evening in with part. us. Okay, but a number but, of uh, your let former... Me, let me say this. Uh, obviously, it isn't just one person or one thing that has made the difference here, and it won't be one person or one thing that will make the difference not only in dealing with this massive federal budget deficit, but in putting together a strong and vibrant economic future for this country. But every team has to have a quarterback. Some just have to call the signals and throw the ball. Uh, you're not a successful quarterback unless they're blocking for you, unless somebody's downfield to catch your passes. But that's what a president does. That's what a governor does. But it's been teamwork in this state that has made the difference. It's been bringing business and labor and the educational community together with state government with community leadership that has made the difference, and I think that's the same kind of leadership and the same kind of teamwork we must have nationally. Well, a number of your former colleagues here at the Kennedy School um, have questioned the job that you have done as quarterback. Uh, one of them, Robert Reich, a lecturer in public policy, says it would be a miracle if Massachusetts didn't do as well as it has. Mike Dukakis has helped at the margin. And in a special report that was done here on the state's economy, you know it, you're smiling already, Ronald Ferguson and Helen Ladd say state policy probably played at most a marginal role in producing the state's economic miracle. So on reflection, do you think that maybe some of the credit that you're reaching for and articulating may be unjustified? Well, let me say again that a lot of things went into this. Uh, I didn't create Harvard and MIT and 118 other colleges and universities. Uh, I'm not responsible for a very special quality of life that the state has. but. All of those things were here in 1975, and they were calling us Taxachusetts in the new Appalachia. Uh, something had to make a difference, and if you go out across this state and ask people, I think they'll tell you that a very aggressive state government role, a very aggressive state economic development program made a difference, especially in those regions and communities in this state that were hurting, were declining, were depressed, and today are enjoying uh, new prosperity, new growth, and very good jobs for their people. That, I think, is the unique contribution that state government has made, and it's the kind of presidential leadership that I'd like to bring to the presidency. I think we need it. In 1975, this state was getting about $3 billion in government military contracts. It's now getting, I'm told, $9 billion. Now, will you acknowledge that that $6 billion in additional revenue might have had a good bit to do with the economic prosperity in the state? Not very much, actually, uh, Marvin, in the total scheme of things. We've created about 650,000 new jobs in the past 10 years in the state, less than 5% of defense-related. And as a matter of fact, uh, the number of defense-related jobs has dropped a little bit this past year. Uh, now, we do a good deal of military R&D, as you know, and if that money was going into civilian R&D, we'd be doing civilian R&D. And I hope one of these days that we can move some of that military research and development money into civilian research and development purposes. But the uh, strength of this state's comeback economically has been in our diversity, uh, not as a result of the military buildup, and uh, I hope it remains that way. I want us to make our contribution to the national defense, but I never want to see this state again become so dependent on the Pentagon budget that when people start making cuts, we get into trouble. One of the jokes about Michael Dukakis is that 
He has never met a weapons system that he liked, and he's never met a defense budget that he wouldn't like to cut. Would you give credit to the Reagan administration over the last seven years for having built up America's defenses? Well, let me respond to the first uh, comment before I go on to the second. Uh, I want this country to have a strong national defense. I'm not sure after the expenditure of billions and billions of dollars that we have it. And I am very concerned about what's happened to our conventional defense capability. We have a massive nuclear deterrent, and we need a nuclear deterrent. 12,000 strategic nuclear warheads, uh, enough to blow up the Soviet Union about 40 times over. They have 11,000. And in the meantime, uh, I have serious questions about what's happening to our conventional defense capability, to the weapons, equipment, ammunition, support, training, airlift and sea lift capacity that we're giving our conventional forces. Now, we all know in the face of the kind of severe fiscal difficulty that this country is in that defense budgets are not going to grow over the course of the next year or two or three. I think we all understand that. So the job of the next president is going to be to make some hard choices within what is a fairly fixed defense budget. And given the strength of our nuclear deterrent, uh, when you make those choices, I think we've got to put some of those resources into strengthened conventional defense capability. So that's where I want to put my emphasis as president, and that's what I think the country's national defense requires. But at this particular point, Governor, if you were president, would you also seek to cut back on the defense budget or keep it more or less where it is now? Well, I think at this point, if we can simply keep that defense budget stable, we'll be doing well. Obviously, if uh, we're successful in uh, negotiating with the Soviet Union, uh, deep cuts in strategic weapons and the test ban treaty and conceivably reductions in conventional forces, then maybe you can cut that budget. But just to keep the defense budget stable, Marvin, is going to require some significant cuts in weapon systems. Uh, I'd cut Star Wars back to where it was before the president announced this initiative in 1983. I think it's a fantasy, and I don't think it uh, is worth the expenditure of money that uh, is involved in, in any of I interrupt budget. you when you say things like that? I, it jumps into my mind, and I'm sorry. sorry. But what may, how do you know it's a fantasy? Because uh, based on the information I have and on uh, analyses done by people whose judgment I respect, uh, I think it is highly unlikely that this system will ever work. And in any event, testing it and deploying it is illegal under the ABM treaty. And I don't believe that this country ought to be engaging in unlawful activity, particularly under a treaty which we pushed on the Russians and which was our initiative. But I wouldn't do Star Wars. Uh, I wouldn't do two $18 billion supercarriers. Uh, I wouldn't spend $50 billion on a midget man missile. I wouldn't spend hundreds of millions of dollars on a three-hour space plane from Washington to Tokyo. I think these are things which uh, are neither necessary nor desirable, particularly when there are serious questions about our conventional defense capability, and we simply aren't putting the resources we need into that, and that's something which I think ought to be a priority. I want to go back to my question that I started the series with. Do you give any credit to the Reagan administration for building up America's defenses in the 80s? I think our uh, forces are probably uh, somewhat stronger. Uh, I'm impressed, for example, that uh, the qualifications, the pay, the training of our fighting forces is better, and I think we're getting a more qualified, uh, a better recruit than we did seven or eight years ago. I'd like to build on that and expand on it. Uh, but uh, I am also very concerned about a Pentagon which today, as you know, is in chaos. Uh, an outgoing Secretary of Defense who refused to accept the fact that that budget was not going to increase, and an incoming Secretary of Defense who has acknowledged that he has a massive job to do to get that place back in shape, to manage it, and to get some value for our defense dollar. Why do you think the Russians have returned, uh, one, to the negotiating table, two, to accepting the President's 1981 proposal on a zero option on the medium-range missiles in Europe, if it were not for the uh, significant military buildup of the United States during that time? That may have played some role, but I think the reason Mr. Gorbachev is at the negotiating table uh, is because the Soviet Union as a society is in very deep trouble. Uh, it's a closed society. It's a society that's failing. It's a society whose economy has stagnated for the past 10 years, uh, very serious social problems, health problems. Uh, Non-Russian ethnic groups 
comprise a majority in the Soviet Union for the first time since the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, I think what you have in Gorbachev is, is new leadership, which is less ideological, more pragmatic, and which understands that if they continue to devote 16% of their GNP to the military, that they're going to become a second or third rate economic power. That's what I think really has brought them to the table. Uh, I don't deny that uh, our military buildup has probably added to that, but I think it's uh, very serious domestic problems in the Soviet Union, which has brought forth this new leadership and new leadership which seems to be significantly different from what we've had in the past. Governor, in one of your uh, position papers on arms control, it is said, we have a shared interest, we and the Russians, I assume, in doing all we can to discourage either side from being tempted to launch a first nuclear strike, unquote. Now, the Russians have already said publicly that they will not be the first to launch a nuclear strike. Would a Dukakis administration make a similar pledge? No. Why? I would pledge no early first use, but I don't see how you can have a credible nuclear deterrent and make that commitment especially when Russian conventional forces in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union far outbalance uh, Western conventional forces out of the NATO alliance. Governor, obviously one of the biggest problems you'd have as president would be the manner in which you dealt with the Soviet Union. It is the only country in the world that can inflict mortal damage on this right. one. Do you feel that you have a, a sufficiently good grounding, a sufficiently good understanding about the reality of the Soviet Union, its leadership, its people, economy? Yes, I think I do. Obviously, if one were president, one would have access to even more information, more knowledge, more intelligence, but uh, I've been a student of foreign policy all my life, even though uh, my experience has been at the state and local level. Uh, I must say, uh, I think what's happening these days in the Soviet Union is uh, intriguing to put it mildly uh, obviously the winds of change are sweeping through the Soviet Union uh, where it's going to end uh, whether Gorbachev himself can survive uh, what the significance of the Yeltsin affair uh, is I mean all of these things are fascinating and uh, I'm not sure any of us at this point can tell but I don't think anyone looking at the Soviet Union over the past uh, two or three years uh, can help but come to the conclusion that something is different and I would dearly love to be the president who pursues the opportunity for what conceivably could be a very significant breakthrough uh, in arms control, arms reduction, and in our relationship uh, with the Soviet Union. Have you yourself ever uh, met a Soviet leader? Have you ever met Gorbachev? No. Or uh, Brezhnev, Khrushchev, any of the recent None of the, of, the, of, the top of the top leaders. Have you yourself ever spent any significant amount of time in the Soviet in Union? In the Soviet Union, no. But I'm not sure that that's necessary. Uh, no, I guess one international leader. No. Um, who are your advisors on Soviet affairs? A few of them are in the room here, but I'm not sure they'd want to be identified. No. <laughs> uh, one of the great advantages, Marvin, of being the governor of Massachusetts is that there is a State Department in exile, a Defense Department in exile, and <laughs> an arms control and disarmament agency in exile within about 10 miles of the State House in Boston. So I'm uh, in a position to draw on an awful lot of people, not just in this institution, which I happen to be very close to, but in institutions uh, throughout the metropolitan area. I also have a very good group of advisors in Washington and others around the country. I'm somebody who, uh, as most people who know me will tell you, uh, generally make up my own mind, but uh, these are very, very good people, and I've gained a great deal from having had access to them and having been able to consult with them. Do you, um, have you read any of the almost uh, bestseller type books on modern day Russia, such as the Hedrick Smith book on the Russians, the Robert Kaiser book, or perhaps even I haven't read those. Marshall uh, Goldman's book on the Gorbachev challenge. I stay, uh, I, I read some of Marshall's uh, things, although generally in the popular press and mm -hmm. some of his monographs and uh, articles and so on. But uh, uh, I found uh, some of the latest commentary to be uh, not only interesting but rather intriguing. I thought Gorbachev's speech, which was never delivered but was released on the future of the United Nations and the International Court of Justice was one of the most extraordinary documents I've ever seen. If the man believes what he said in that speech, then uh, there is a basis for very serious negotiation with the Soviet Union. Time will tell, and 
He's got to be plan? challenged on that, but I would love to be in a position to see whether he is serious about uh, building the United Nations as a peacekeeping uh, agency, as an anti-terrorism institution, uh, mandatory ju jurisdiction for the International Court of Justice kind of sounds like the kinds of things that we were suggesting in the 60s. And if, in fact, he's serious, uh, these are very significant documents. Okay, then let me ask you this. Uh, how would you define the problem with the Soviet Union? Is it an ideological problem? Is it the compulsion of great Russian nationalism? Where, where is the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union? I think Union? it's all of the above. It's partly ideological. It's partly geopolitical. Uh, it's partly the clash of two great superpowers. Uh, I think ideology plays a major role. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting questions is whether or not, uh, at least under Gorbachev and the new Soviet leadership, ideology is now beginning to take a back seat to pragmatism and to uh, a serious... Uh, concern with very deep-seated economic and social problems in the Soviet Union. Now, I think that's what's happening, but we won't know until we have a president who's prepared to challenge him on some of these things and negotiate seriously. Okay, would you be prepared to invite the Soviet Union in to negotiate the future of the Middle East? They're there. I mean, this notion that we can exclude the Soviet Union from the Middle East, in my judgment, is absurd. I mean, the Soviet Union is all over the Middle East. So and, that you uh, would invite them into an international conference? Not a question, question of inviting them in. I think, for example, that a multilateral peacekeeping force in the Persian Gulf uh, might be one way to end that conflict. No, I'm not talking about the Persian Gulf. I'm talking about the Arab-Israeli problem now. Would you invite them in as a participant, as the United States, um, in a negotiated solution of the Middle East problem? I think uh, Shimon Peres's proposal for an international conference under the aegis of the Security Council makes sense, but only if negotiations are conducted bilaterally between and among the parties, presumably Israel, Jordan, Egypt, and responsible elements in the Palestinian community who well, accept... Let me ask you about the Palestinian community. You have also been quoted as saying that there can be peace in the Middle East without a homeland for the Palestinians. Give us your vision of what a Middle East peace would look like and where in that peace is there room for three to four million Palestinians? Well, I'm not sure how precise one can be, but let's assume that there was such a conference uh, where Israel, Jordan, Egypt, and responsible elements in the Palestinian community who accepted resolutions 242 and 338 were present and were negotiating bilaterally. I think it's conceivable that, uh, consistent with the Camp David Accords, it might be possible to come up with a plan in which there was uh, an autonomous region under the jurisdiction of Jordan, which uh, was available, if you will, for Palestinians, was a place where Palestinians could live. And You think that would be a formula for peace? It's conceivable that it would be. Uh, there's no way that I or you or any of us can uh, make that judgment, but my sense is that there might be a basis for that in accordance with the Camp David Accords and with what at that time we hoped, I think, would be uh, progress toward that kind of a settlement. Now, only the nations and negotiators in question can make that judgment, and at this point, as you know, uh, Israel itself uh, has been unable to develop the political consensus to even join in such a conference. But in my judgment, uh, such a conference would be a constructive step forward. You have been described as a, a truly rational man, highly intelligent, <laughs> and uh, a man who I'm sure sees... my children would agree with you on the question of rationality. All right, but who uh, sees a problem and feels that there has to be a solution. Sometimes. I'm less rational than I used to be, put it that way. Oh, I see, okay. In that case, in the Middle East, for example, there are a number of people who feel that there is not... You may have a set of problems there for which there are no solutions. That may be. That may be. Uh, I don't rule that out. Uh, maybe one of those things where uh, it will be years before there can be a settlement. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that Egypt, Jordan, uh, even some of the other Arab nations that have just come out of this latest conference uh, seem to be adopting a somewhat more moderate stance. Now, that at least may give us a ray of hope that it's possible to come up with a solution which is consistent with the Camp David Accords and what we hope we were achieving then, uh, but there's no way of telling. And, and this kind of a settlement is not going to be imposed from on high. This is something that has to be worked out by these nations and 
by the parties to these negotiations? Let's switch to Central America, and I appreciate that I'm going to ask you a hypothetical question. But it has been speculated about for several years now. If Nicaragua were to suddenly find itself in possession of sophisticated Soviet hardware, like a jet fighter, like a missile uh, that could hit a neighbor, would you as president be prepared to use American military power to stop that kind of building? Yes. I would do no so, as, jo that. as John Kennedy did in the case of the Cuban Missile Crisis. On the other hand, I see no evidence that that's happening. And as a matter of fact, uh, all of the information we have indicates that the Soviet Union has no interest in that and has enough uh, problems back home without getting involved in, in Nicaragua. I think the uh, ARIS plan is the best hope for peace and for the economic and social reconstruction of Central America we've had in a long time. And I would like to see the United States getting enthusiastically behind that plan. As you know, that's not happening. We have the anomalous situation of the Speaker of the House acting as the Secretary of State of the United States pro tem because there is such an enormous vacuum in, in Washington. But I, uh, I think the Irish plan is where we should be. I think we should be supporting it enthusiastically. Uh, and if we did, as Iris himself said when he was here in Boston not too long ago, uh, it would succeed. Western Europe. For the last uh, <coughs> oh, couple of decades now, the United States has maintained a force of about 325,000 troops, most of them in West Germany. Right. Would you be prepared as president to begin a withdrawal of American forces? No, from particularly Europe? if the INF agreement is signed and ratified. I, I would be opposed to withdrawing or reducing the U.S. commitment in Western Europe. It seems to me that if if that agreement is signed and if it's ratified and if uh, intermediate and short-range missiles are taken out of Western Europe, uh, then there's an even stronger case to be made for maintaining the U.S. commitment to NATO and to Western Europe. Let me switch to another subject, namely back at home and, and politics for a moment. Uh, let's assume you get the nomination, you've got a select vice president. Would you give serious consideration to a woman? Sure. Have but let me say, no. Um, but let me say this, and I really haven't thought about it. I've got all I can do to go out there and win this nomination. But let me say this. Uh, the single most important criterion for selecting a running mate, far more important than politics or region or anything else, is whether or not that person, if, God forbid, something happens to the president, can be a first-rate president. Everything else pales by comparison. That's where you start. Now, if you find a person or persons who clearly meet that criterion, then where they come from, who they are, do they provide... Uh, additional strength of the ticket and of the administration if you're elected. Those things are, are relevant. But are you open to the selection of a black as a vice sure. president, Jesse sure. Jackson as a vice president? I wouldn't rule anybody out. Including Jackson? I wouldn't rule anybody out. Or in. There is... Or <laughs> Was the in with reference to Jackson? No. no. To anybody. All right. There's a school of thought, you've heard it before, that a Democrat is going to have an awfully hard time winning next year. Do you share that concern? No. As a matter of fact, uh, shame on us if we lose. Given the economic mess and the managerial mess and some unbelievably bad foreign policy decisions we've had over the course of the past seven years. On the other hand, it isn't going to be handed to us in a silver platter. And since I believe that the issue of jobs and economic growth will be the single most important issue, in this campaign, the Democratic nominee had better be somebody who is not only strongly committed to jobs and economic opportunity for the people of this country, but has a track record and credibility on those issues. I think that's one of the strengths I bring to this campaign, but that's the Democratic Party's stock and trade, and that's where we are, and that's where we've got to be, and, and that's the message that we have to communicate to the American people. If we do, then a Democrat is going to be the next president. I want to ask you also about the impact of television on your campaigning, on everybody's campaigning for that matter. In this room, if I'm not mistaken, in the early 70s, you were doing that PBS program, The Advocates. Daniel Hall and here. And here. Kind of okay. I guess not here. Maybe this place wasn't has the early Has the experience that you picked up doing those kind of programs been an asset to you in running for the presidency? Yes. In what way? Tell us. Well, I think... Why course. is it so important that you be on a first-name basis with a camera? You've been in the business a long time. But I'm not running. You are. You still have your union card, and I still have mine. 
I think when you have an opportunity to do uh, what you've done for years and what I did for a few years, you're just a lot more comfortable in front of that camera. Uh, you're less intimidated by it. And I think you can speak to it and to the American people with a certain amount of ease and persuasiveness that maybe you don't have when you don't have that kind of experience. On the other hand, anyone who's been in politics 5, 10, 15, or 20 years, and most of us have who are running, uh, by this time probably should be pretty comfortable in front of a the camera. There was an interview today, I think, or yesterday, that I read with uh, George Bush in which he said that he doesn't do terribly well on television, he feels, and that therefore he may not wish to appear on programs or he's going to cut back on that kind of thing. And he has certainly been there for a long time, too. So there is something special about the relationship that an individual has with that camera. Is it that powerful a force in American politics? It's a powerful force. It's not everything. It's no substitute for substance. It's no substitute for good grassroots organizing and thousands of people across the country that are working for you and organizing and going out and asking others to work for you. But it is probably the most powerful medium of communication we've ever had in the history of uh, this planet. And if you're running for the presidency, it's something that you probably have to feel pretty comfortable. But you're making the point here that you've got to have substance as well. Yes. Right? My favorite question on this relates to Moses, who led the <laughs> Jews out of Egypt. And according to the Bible, he stuttered. Now, if there had been television then, <laughs> could he have succeeded as a great figure? The waters would never have parted. The waters would never have parted. It is that powerful. It is today. Now, I, I think it can be exaggerated. Uh, we've had a media presidency for seven years, which is beginning to crumble because there isn't much substance there. But uh, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're somebody who, who has substance to you and, and also can communicate effectively via television, uh, I think that's an extra plus. Governor, we're at that point now where I stop asking the questions. The audience begins to ask the questions, and I know three people here who are going to be asking questions. Uh, I don't know what they're going to ask. I don't know who else is going to ask, but if you want to, go over to the microphones now. And please, when you ask your questions, just the questions, no speeches. And Governor, please, brief answer so we can get more of the questions. And why don't we um, start the uh, questioning with Thomas Schelling, a professor of political economy here at the Kennedy School of Government. Professor Schelling. Governor, welcome back to the Kennedy School. I feel completely engulfed by Soviet-American relations. We have a summit coming up. We have an INF agreement that may come over us. We're interested in Glasnost, the opening up of communication and perestroika, the restructuring of the Soviet economy. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, equally important in American foreign policy preoccupations was the People's Republic of China, which has been going through its own Glasnost at least on the scale of the Soviet Union, yes. and a perestroika, which I think may be even more dramatic than anything that Gorbachev has yet accomplished. And yet I can't find that the United States has any attitude toward any policy toward China. And my question, sir, is does the United States have a policy toward China? If so, what is it? Would you, if you were president, change it or add to it? Specifically, do we want the Chinese to succeed in what they're trying to do? And specifically, would we prefer that the Chinese have good relations with the Soviet Union or bad relations with the Soviet Union? Or doesn't it make any difference? <laughs> That's six questions, sir. <laughs> <laughs> at, uh, at, at, at Harvard, we allow you to answer any three. <laughs> I'll answer three if you help my wife to stop smoking. <laughs> this man is an apostle of anti-nicotine -nicot in our society. The governor answered answer the question. <laughs> yeah, I think we have a policy which has been uh, a fairly bipartisan one, actually, a time going back to the Nixon opening, if you will, which is uh, to try to develop and maintain good relations with China, to encourage this movement toward reform, to encourage good trade relations. So this state alone has got a very uh, strong and expanding relationship with Guangdong province, which is a province of 70 million people. And I've been there leading trade missions. They've been back. Uh, and that's part of a much larger picture. And uh, in general, I think 
uh, even in this administration, uh, which oftentimes is so obsessively ideological, there's been uh, a substantial amount of good, pragmatic, uh, bipartisan uh, policy on, on China. I don't think any of us are happy with silkworm missiles being shipped to Iran and being used to uh, add to the conflict and exacerbate the conflict in the Persian Gulf, and I gather that the Chinese have now stopped that or have said that they're going to stop it. Um, I'm somebody who believes that, generally speaking, uh, good relations between and among nations generally is a plus. So I don't have a problem with the notion of uh, better relations between the Soviet Union and China, just so long as it doesn't involve some kind of an alliance which is then turned against us or other free nations. But I think, generally speaking, uh, uh, better relations between us and China and, and improving relations between China and its neighbors, whoever they may be, uh, is a good thing. And I think we ought to encourage that so long as the motives for such improving relations are sound. Let's uh, now go to the balcony, please. Thank you. Governor, a number of issues concerning the status of women will come before the Supreme Court, including uh -huh. sex discrimination, abortion, adoption, and issues affecting women in the workplace. Are you willing to pledge now to search for a qualified woman for the U.S. Supreme Court if a vacancy occurs during your presidency? One of the things that you get from a chief executive who's been a chief executive for nine years is a record, not just promises. And I think if you look at my administration, at uh, the way I select judges, and I have the same authority as Governor of Massachusetts to select judges for life that the president has at the national level, and I don't even need Senate confirmation. Once my nominations go to the Executive Council and they're approved, these appointments become lifetime appointments. I think what you'll see is a record uh, of the appointment of very good people. And by the way, people who I've met before I appoint them. Uh, as a matter of fact, and I don't think this is a radical suggestion, I. Uh, not only have a judicial nominating council that screens all candidates for judgeships, down to and including district court judgeships, but they recommend three finalists to me, and I interview every one of those finalists personally. And I would hope and expect that in selecting justices for the highest court in the land, I would at least do that and probably a good deal more. Sounds like an but, outrageous idea. Well, it's, <laughs> there's, oh, there's, a, there's a lot to be recommended, uh, a lot to be said for. In any event, I think my record speaks for itself, and obviously I would be seeking qualified women to sit at every level of the federal judiciary. Let's move over here for a question, please. Yes, Governor Dukakis, uh, I agree with you that if you've been governor for nine of 13, of the past 13 years, you do have a record. According to the federal government, Boston Harbor is the most polluted harbor in the country. Our prisons are the most overcrowded in the country. Many of our mental health facilities have been, question, yes, have been decertified by the federal government. My question is, with a four to one, Democratic majority here in the local state legislature, are you really a can-do governor that can get things through Congress? Yeah, I didn't pollute Boston Harbor, but I'm the guy that's cleaning it up. And we've made more progress in the past three years toward the cleanup of that harbor than we have in the past hundred. Yes, we have overcrowded prisons. So does, so does just about every state in the country. We also have a state where crime has dropped more in the past four years than any state in the country with one exception. And that wasn't an accident. I take my responsibility to enforce the law seriously in the state. I feel very strongly about violent crime. We've been very tough on violent crime while observing and being committed to due process and the Bill of Rights, and that's one of the reasons the state has one of the best anti-crime records uh, in the country. And we are now embarked on probably the most ambitious program for improving the staffing and the condition of our state mental hospitals and, and our state mental health services of any state in the nation. Now, all of those things have happened in the past four years, and I think it's one of the reasons why this state is viewed as being one of the most effective and one of the most progressive and one of the most successful states in the country. Thank you. Question on the balcony, please. Yeah, on the subject of energy policy, it's clear that our long-term petroleum supplies are limited, and the price can only really go up over the long term. At the same time, we've seen you come out against projects like Seabrook in New Hampshire. My question is, how will your energy policy as president address our long-term needs for both inexpensive and plentiful energy as we go you know, into the next century. We have all kinds of uh, energy supplies, energy resources, and the possibility for additional energy in this country without 
committing ourselves irrevocably to nuclear power. Now, I'm not ideologically opposed to nuclear power. My problem with Seabrook, as anybody knows who knows anything about the area, is that it is just impossible to evacuate that area in the event of a serious nuclear accident. I mean, you can't evacuate it on a Saturday afternoon in July without a serious nuclear accident, let alone uh, uh, something happens down there. That's my problem with Seabrook. And unless and until somebody finds an acceptable and safe way to dispose of high-level radioactive waste in this country, I think it's unconscionable to continue to build more and more nuclear plants. We still don't have an answer on that problem. Now, having said that, we have 300 years supply of coal and clean coal burning technologies that are available now. We have 150 years worth of natural gas, and believe me, I'd love to generate electric energy in Massachusetts with natural gas, and there are a lot of people in Texas that would like to sell it to us, and it doesn't cause acid rain, and it's clean and efficient. We have uh, photovoltaic energy, which is only a few years away, in my judgment, with some federal investment in becoming cost competitive with regular forms of energy. We have an emerging cogeneration industry, which has unbelievable potential. And just to give you an example, without going on at great length, as to just how much energy there is out there, when the Boston Edison Company, a few months ago, issued a public request for proposals for energy to the small power producing industry, they were looking for 200 megawatts. They got 66 proposals for a total of 2,054 megawatts at prices a half or less of what energy will cost if Seabrook is ever opened up up there in Seabrook, New Hampshire. That just gives you some sense of what's going on. There's plenty of energy out there. The question is, do we have the will and the capacity to go out there and get it? Our oh, next question right here, please. Yes, Governor. Currently, there are five uh, voluntary national service bills pending in Congress, meaning encouraging students to serve their community. Many times they're linked to tuition aid. If you were elected pre president, what would your position be on the issue of youth national service? I am not for mandatory service. I think that's a bad idea. I think it's almost a contradiction in terms. Uh, you can't mandate people to serve in the kind of way and, and for the things that you and I, I think would like uh, young people to, to serve. But I am very anxious to try to bring back some of the spirit of the early 60s. John Kennedy had an enormous impact on many of us who were just coming out of uh, college and graduate school at that time, uh, literally transformed the environment for public service in this country, especially for young people. I'm particularly interested in reviving the National Teacher Corps. Half of our public school teachers in the United States are going to retire in the next five to ten years. Half of them. And I go to colleges and universities and high schools and I ask how many students are seriously interested in a career in public school teaching, and if I get five hands going up out of 500, I'm lucky. I want to revive the National Teacher Corps. I want to make it a Peace Corps for teaching. I want to give young people an opportunity at least to try out a teaching assistance, assistantship, a te teaching internship. That's just one example of the kind of voluntary national service I would like to encourage, and I think we could do a lot more at very modest cost. Uh, so I'd, I'd like very much to do that, and, and I hope I can. Governor, our next question comes from Art Rublin, a member of the Student Advisory Committee of the Institute of Politics. Art? Governor, um, I'm particularly interested in the area of uh, nuclear proliferation policy and uh, interested in what your view was on how the Reagan administration has done in this area and what changes you would How they've done? What, how they're, the, they've the done nothing. <laughs> and I'm very concerned about it. I think this is very, very important. It isn't just that the Soviet Union and the United States possess uh, this incredible nuclear arsenal that we do. It's that uh, a number of nations already have this capability, more are going to get it, and uh, there is a very solemn responsibility on the United States and the Soviet Union to take nuclear proliferation seriously. And uh, not only to be serious about our responsibilities under existing treaties, but to exercise the kind of leadership that both of us must, in this case together, if we're serious about stopping the spread of nuclear weapons, and I take that responsibility very seriously. Uh, I've seen very little evidence in the past seven years that the current administration does it all, and that for me would be a very important priority. Governor, our next question right here, please. <clears throat> yes, um, Governor, a question that President Ford almost had to deal with uh, directly 
if a nuclear, if a terrorist organization was to prove that they had nuclear capabilities and was to make an outrageous ransom demand to you for the city of Boston and gave you 24 hours, and it was determined that they definitely did have that ability, how would you handle that situation? And specifically, if they had no particular geographic base that they were operating from, which would make retaliation a very difficult um, situation indeed. Well, 30, do it in 30 seconds. <laughs> Let me talk more generally about terrorism. I think this country and the international community has got to be very tough on international terrorism. International terrorism is international crime, pure and simple. It's unacceptable and it's unconscionable. And we've got to go after it the way you go after crime. Tough, no holes barred, never concessions, never concessions under any circumstances. If you grant concessions to terrorists, you might as well forget about stopping it because you're encouraging it, uh, and we all know what happens when you do that. Uh, Bibles and birthday cakes and agreements to free Arab terrorists in Kuwaiti jails, uh, outrageous kind of policy that this administration what about had followed. What you about go after terrorists and you use every single tool or weapon you can undercover operations sting operations and if necessary military strikes against terrorist bases we got to move along in the balcony please governor you spoke earlier about combining public resources with private initiation to form a strategy of nation private initiatives private initiatives this is not a fraternity we're running here this is <laughs> be that as it may you, you want to combine these two yes. items to form a, a strategy of nationwide economic growth. Right. Can you elaborate a little more specifically on the strategy of nationwide economic growth, uh, specifically with regard to the role of the public and private sectors, sure. and whether or not this strategy will involve a tax increase? How many questions is that? <laughs> Only three, I Governor. Three, I think. Well, let me start with the first part and see if I can add a bit to the second. Um, yes, I think we need strong and aggressive economic leadership in the White House beginning in 1989. That means getting our fiscal house in order by making tough choices on spending, by putting in place and leading an aggressive strategy for economic growth and job creation, by going out and getting new revenue beginning with $110 billion a year in federal taxes owed that aren't being paid in this country, and I would go out and try to collect every dime I could of that money. Can't rule out new taxes. No serious candidate for the presidency should, but that's where you begin. And by getting interest rates down, and every point reduction in interest saves you another $15 billion in the federal deficit. That's the first step. But we have to do much more than that. You don't elect the president just to be a bookkeeper and a bill collector. We've got to invest in needed public infrastructure, in good schools and good skills, in technology, and in regional development. And I would do all of those things because that's the way you create economic growth, that's the way you get the rate of growth up, and that's the way you create good jobs for people in this country. Which rate Governor, next question, just one I Does might, but answer? not until I had gone out and tried to collect every single dime I could of the $110 billion in taxes owed that aren't being paid in this country. Tax compliance is now at 81% in this country. 81%. That's unacceptable. It's unconscionable. If we simply increase the rate of compliance by five percentage points, that's $35 billion in additional revenue annually, three times what they've been arguing about on Capitol Hill for the past month. That's where I begin. Question right here, please. Governor Dukakis, I'm a public school teacher from the state of Oregon. And I'd like to know what your priority would be as president in the area of funding public education, particularly in the area of compensatory education to the disadvantaged and educational opportunities for the handicapped, both of which have been cut by the Reagan administration. Well, I'm going to try to get those resources back, although I'm not going to kid you, and I don't think any serious candidate for the presidency can. The next president is not going to have billions and billions of dollars to spend in his first year or two as president. We're looking at massive federal budget deficits and uh, a major job in getting that deficit down. That's why my first and most important educational priority as president would be good teaching and good teachers. And that is why I would create a national fund for teacher excellence. I've suggested a quarter of a billion dollars. That's about one-fifteenth of Star Wars, which would provide scholarships for young people willing to make a commitment to teaching, would revive the National Teacher Corps, would create a network of field centers of teaching and learning for veteran teachers like yourself, 
could go take a sabbatical, refresh, revive, do research, come back to teaching. That's where I begin. Now, over time, as we get our fiscal act together, then I think we can begin to commit some resources to compensatory education, to education for the handicapped. But I would expect the states to participate in that. I think it's very important that state governments assume and carry out their responsibility for the education of their youngsters, and so I would expect the states to be an important part of that. Governor, our next question comes from the balcony, please. Thank you. Governor, I'm cutting class to be able to ask you a question. Uh, it's a question about You're human... kidding me. It's right in there. It's a question about never, human values. I've got a class in here at 9 o'clock at night. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It's a question about human values. Yes. It happened before I arrived in the state, but I understand from a song that I've heard that uh, there was a gay individual that uh, was perfectly qualified to have adopted a child, did so, and then lost the child solely because of his uh, sexual preference, sexual affiliation. And I understood further from the song that you had appointed a Blue Ribbon Commission to study the matter. I went to Swarthmore also, and what I'd like to know is that the kind of values that you learned at Swarthmore? Well, you got the story wrong to begin with, so let me begin with that. I'm somebody who uh, abhors discrimination against anybody. Race, on the basis of race or ethnicity or sexual preference or gender. And that's why I'm working very hard right now to see if we can get a civil rights bill through my legislature which will prohibit discrimination on the basis of sexual preference. On the other hand, there is no civil right to be a foster parent. And this involved foster care, not adoption. And we have adopted in this commonwealth a policy in which relatives and uh, two-parent families with other children with prior parenting experience are preferred when we place youngsters in foster care. On the other hand, there are many situations in which there are not relatives or what I will call a traditional family with other youngsters. And so in those circumstances, we will place a foster child in another setting. When I was presented with legislation by my legislature to absolutely prohibit the placement of foster children in gay or lesbian households, I vetoed it. Next question right here, please. Yes, Governor, I've heard before that the best way to measure someone's character is to look at the people that they admire. And I was just wondering, if you were to choose three former presidents since the turn of this century that you most admire, who would they be in just a brief sentence on each of them why you chose them? Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, and John Kennedy. Uh, FDR, because he had extraordinary uh, confidence and leadership ability and was able to pick this country up when it was as down as it's ever been and move us forward and inspire people to do that. Harry Truman, because he told it like it was and didn't mince words and was straight and honest with the American people, even though it got him into an awful lot of difficult and hot political water. And John Kennedy, I guess, because John Kennedy was the inspiration uh, for me and for literally millions of young people in the 50s and early 60s, uh, and without that man and his inspiration, I suspect that many of us never would have gone into political life in the first place. Uh, all too short a career, but somebody who could reach out to young people and uh, inspire us and encourage us to go into public service in a way that I'm not sure any president ever has. Um, our last questioner, uh, Richard Zeckhauser, Professor of Political Economy here at the Kennedy School of Government. Good evening, Professor. Governor. Hi, Dick. Um, I wanted to ask you about your strong and aggressive economic policy, um, and in particular how strong and aggressive it might be. Uh, the studies that Marvin Kalb cited earlier, which were somewhat skeptical of the contribution of the Dukakis administration, did give you credit or blame for reallocating industry in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what you think the federal government's role is in reallocating industry um, across the United States, and also in identifying uh, successful and unsuccessful industry. I only have one question, but I have the second part of it, which is to what extent the Massachusetts miracle is replicable if you believe, as many of us in this room do, that part of our success is drawing extraordinary people from around the country. I think the people who have spoken tonight have identified themselves from being around the country, drawing in a disproportionate share of federal money, which is what our outstanding congressional delegation and our outstanding governor have managed uh, to do, and our uh, universities and high-tech industry, which is also unique. And not everybody can borrow from everybody else. Thank you. Where do you want me to begin? <laughs> How much time do I have? 
Well, let me say this, Dick. Uh, there's no question that there's a confluence of extraordinary resources and talent in this state. But let's remember that it was here in 1975 and we were Taxachusetts in the new Appalachian. So something must have happened to change it. And I would suggest to you that it was aggressive economic leadership and the investment of public resources in combination with private initiative that made the difference. That's what we've got to do nationally. We've got to take public resources and invest them in needed public infrastructure, in good schools and good training for our workers, in technology so that we can create research centers, uh, centers that spawn new industry and new technologies, not just in Massachusetts and in California, but all over the country in association with some great research universities. And investment in regional development, and I mean aggressive regional development in those regions and states that are hurting and hurting badly. Now, that doesn't involve, in my mind, a reallocation, but it does involve creating incentives so that expanding companies will expand into these regions that need jobs and need employment uh, with some help from the federal government in partnership with state governments. I wouldn't let state governments off the hook for one minute. I would expect them to step up to the plate and put some resources in there as well. But it's that kind of investment in regional development which I think can make a difference. If we do those things, I think we'll have a strong and vibrant economy that creates good jobs for the people of this country. Governor, I have a frivolous final question in 30 seconds. I found out today that ballroom dancing is the most popular show on public television. Do you dance? Yes. You do? What was the last time you took your wife to ballroom dancing? <laughs> I think you're good. I think I think the last time we danced together was at our son's wedding in August. But let me say this: uh, if I'm that's successful, if I'm successful, we're going to do some Greek dancing in the East Room of the White House, and that'll be it. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you for being our guest. Thanks to you all for being a very gracious, warm, and enthusiastic audience. Next week, another candidate. Senator Paul Simon of Illinois, a Democratic candidate for President of the United States. And now on behalf of the Joan Shorenstein Barone Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy, which is part of the John F. Kennedy School of Government here at Harvard, I'm Marvin Kalb. We'll see you next week with Candidates 88.